All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it might be afternoon, or is it still morning? Good morning. Good morning. Well, there we go. I saw somebody leaving. I said, I haven't even spoke yet. Usually, I have to start speaking before they leave. So that's good that uh, everyone stayed. My name is Mike Chablik. Um Because it's being taped, I've got to just give a little disclaimer. I work for a financial services company. I am not here as a financial advisor right now. I'm not giving you financial advice. I'm not giving you tax advice. I know that sounds strange considering we're talking about networking, but if you knew the rules in my industry, you know why I'm saying that. So, um, and I do this, I work in my practice with a lot of people in transition. And the reason why I do this is to give back. And I've worked with Rochester Works for a number of years in several local organizations. And I'm always impressed, actually amazed, by the amount of intelligence and expertise I see in a room like this when I do one of these presentations. So, my hat's off to all of you. You're all probably far smarter than me. <laughs> uh, well, it's the truth. I see people in technology. And that's how this whole talk started actually was when I got into working with people, a lot of people in transition are technical. How many people in the room have a technical background? How many people in the room when they got let go said, I'd like to go in the sales? That's usually the ratio. We get the crickets. So I kind of had this light bulb go off in my head and I said, you know what, a lot of the clients that I work with and people that I interact with at networking groups, they don't have any sales background. They don't have any networking background. They don't it's just not something that we naturally do. But what happens is when you get let go, the primary source in which people find a job, or if you're a job seeker coming out of college, the primary way, and I'm sure you've all heard this, what's the primary way people find jobs? That's right, people they know. People they know that are either working or know somebody at the company. So what I did was I decided that I was going to put together a presentation for job seekers using the sales and marketing techniques that I've amassed over the years and all the books that I've read. I'm the complex coordinator for Merrill Lynch. Oh, oh my God. Oh, too bad we can't dub that. But I'm the complex coordinator for the firm that I work for, for all the trainees. So I guide them on how to engage clients, talk to the marketing sales. And what I did was I just morphed it into a program that we can use for job seekers, okay? So that's why I'm here. So I'm going to ask you all a question. If the last page of your packet had a list of 20 employers and I told you one of them was the next hiring person in your life, how long would you wait to call them? Let me ask you this, and you don't have to be kind. Would you even stay for the workshop? <laughs> so why don't we call employers all day? We don't like rejection in general. It, think about it. I mean, I remember my first cold call in the business. I went to FLCC, and then I got my bachelor's from RIT. And uh, I went back later in life, so I got my bachelor's while I was already in school. But I remember my first cold call, I called Finger Lakes Community College. And I was going to try to present them with the uh, idea of doing an education plan for their employees through me, right? So I'm all gung-ho, I'm a rookie, I'm in this bullpen, so when you start out in finance, you're in a bullpen, big room with phones. They give you a phone book, and they say, go with God, my friend. So get on the phone, I'm all gung-ho, the person picks up the phone, and I say, hi, uh, Finger Lakes Community College, I'd like to talk to you about education plans. The woman said, what are you talking about? I turned pale white and hung the phone up. That was my first experience in making a cold call. It is not a pleasant experience, folks. So I'm here to tell you that you're not alone. Okay, and, uh, and this workshop isn't intended to make you cold calling experts. It's not. It's intended to give you some ideas that you might be able to utilize as you go out in the world. I don't do this for a living. I don't coach people for a living. I'm not looking for anything from you. I just want you to take something I give you today and use it in your job search, okay? So my qualification to give you some of these things are I've led my company in growth for the last three years. I work in a sales and coaching atmosphere, and I'm consistently looking for ways to grow my practice. I actively set goals. I read a lot of books, a lot of self-development books. I'm the only advisor that Rochester Works brings into their place on a quarterly basis, and I consider that a privilege because there's about 5,000 advisors locally, and 2,000 of them would love to come into Rochester Works, I can guarantee you. But the reason why they have me in is integrity and that I always try to give honest advice, and I won't be in your bushes trying to sell you a mutual fund. So what we're going to talk about today is everybody's favorite radio station. What's in it for me? That's everybody's favorite radio station. That's why you all came here today. That's why we came to the job fair. Most of the time, 
Human beings in general think about themselves about 85% of the time. I remember you from one of my workshops at Rochester Works a few years back, you came. Um, so that's the one thing, like I was at a, uh, I was at one of these speed networking things. Talk about an awkward situation. Anyone do one of those? That's harder than speed dating. But uh, so I was at the armory downtown and they put me in, Annie put me in as a plant. So she said, go in there and just act like you're a job seeker and, and see if you can critique some of the people network. I said, okay. So I sit down, first person I sit in front of, you know, they give you all the do's and don'ts, right? How to talk to people, what to say, what not to say. First thing this woman says is, who do you know that can give me a job? I said, is this your first time doing this? She goes, yes, it is. How can you tell? There's no reason. <laughs> but in general, we're tuned into our station. What's in it for me? So when we're out looking, when we're talking to people, engaging people, looking for a referral, looking to be able to get a connection, we have to think in terms of them. So I'll give you a great example uh, in my own practice. I used to, I need attorneys and accountants to refer clients to a lot of the time because I don't write wills. And uh, I used to call the attorney's office and say, hi, this is Mike Chablick from XYZ Company, and uh, is so-and-so there? Hold on. He'd hear where I was from, say, no, he's died. He's left the building. He's not here. He's out to lunch. He doesn't want to know you, those type of things. So then I changed what I was saying when I called. And this is where you can relate this back to when you look for a job. I called up the attorney's place, and I said, hi, I'm looking for Joe Smith. I was wondering if he's taking new clients. Hold on one sec. Hi, this is Joe Smith. The reason I say that is because we have to think in terms of what the other person wants. So if you're calling somebody to get a referral from them, you want to try to make some sort of connection with them so they have an idea of what it's worth to give them your time. Okay? We, as natural human beings, usually think in terms of what we need and what we want. It's that empathy to go on the other side of that, to say, okay, what is that person giving up? Uh, a lot of the time, if you have to deal with a gatekeeper, make a joke to them. Tell them, I know I'm probably the thousandth person you've talked to today, and if I actually get through, they'll have your head. But please have some mercy on me. They'll laugh, because most people just call up and try to steamroll their way through. So do they have a family or friend obligation? Do they owe you a favor? I'm a big believer in karma. What goes around comes around. If you were somebody in your professional life that helps people, that gives out names, that talks to people, that tries to be a resource, you'll get that reciprocated to you as you talk to people. That's just how this world works. Do they owe you a favor? Maybe they know what an asset you are. And a lot of the time we think when we're, what's the biggest thing a lot of people say when they're looking for a job? What do they feel like they're doing? It begins with an H. Two words. Well, most people say they feel like they're asking for a handout, that they're calling and asking for something. Don't ever feel like that. That's what I always tell my, my clients and people I network with. They're like, well, I hate to call people and put people out. Don't think like that, because that's not what they're thinking. That's what you're thinking. And so a lot of the time, when I would go to initially make phone calls to people or talk to people, I'd be thinking, they don't want my phone call. So when they s sounded like they didn't want my phone call, I said, see, I was right. And I get off the phone. But if you call and you say, you know what, I know I'm an asset. I know I can provide some services. And you call with that attitude, you'll get a different response. The other thing I always say, and you guys will laugh at this, but when you leave here, for the one thing you do for the day Go to CVS and get a little cosmetic mirror. Now, work with me here. Follow me, guys, because I know you're looking at me like, okay, they really brought in a weird one for this workshop. Smile while you dial. Put that little mirror on your desk when you make phone calls. Watch. Isn't that odd? Even if you're not in a good mood, if somebody smiles at you, they'll smile back. Even if you look crazy, they'll smile right back at you. So when you're on the phone, when you're calling people, smile, even if you're not in a good mood. Because people can feel a smile through the phone. And people can feel a frown through the phone. I, I, this has been my experience. If you generally want to get a positive response from people, they have to feel positive when they're talking to you. If they're the 30th person you followed up for for the day and it's a real important connection, don't do it till tomorrow. Because if you get on the phone and you're grumpy, you might foil an opportunity that you've worked hard on because you're not in a good mood. And that happens all the time. People generally want to help people. You ever help that little old lady across the street? I was in BJ's the other day, and I saw a woman. She, I actually I said, I hope I'm not being intrusive, but how old are you? She was 76, and she was putting a kayak in her car. 
an eight-foot kayak. I, I look, I mean, it's one of those things you don't see very often. I'm loading groceries, and I look, and this little old lady with a Volvo with an eight-foot kayak. So I came over and said, can I help you? She said, oh, that'd be great. So I loaded it up, and it was for her. But the cool thing about it was I got as much of a reward for helping her as she got for letting it get into the car. So don't ever think you're putting people out. People generally want to help people, okay? <laughs> And put the ghosts on the table. You're going to hear a lot of different things today and at workshops all over the place about how to engage people when you're looking for a job. Some people will say, don't tell them you're looking for work. You know, well, let me tell you, if you're calling somebody in the middle of the day, odds are they know that you're not, like, just chilling out. So what I usually do is I tell people, put the ghost on the table. And I'll give you an example. If you all got a phone call from me during the day, you were home, or at dinner time, which is when we love to get telemarketing calls, right? <laughs> Everyone like those calls at dinner time, right, as you're getting the soup spoon in? Why do waiters always do that, right? As you take your first bite, how is everything? <laughs> it's very good. I don't know why that is. So when you make a phone call, if you got a phone call and you picked the phone up and the person said, good evening, what would you think? Right? Sounds salesy, don't it? My wife tells me, don't use your sales stuff on me. I want to get my point across. It never works anyway. But So if you call and you put the ghost on the table, if somebody calls you and said, hi, Mr. Smith, you and I don't know each other and forgive the intrusion. I don't even like making calls like this. It's very awkward. But I'm very enthusiastic about something that I have going on and I wanted to ask you if you had a moment. You still might just hang up on him, but you might take one second. You might say, God, this poor person. And that's because you're putting the ghost on the table. And it also establishes a human connection when you call that person, when you call that gatekeeper, and you, or if you're in somebody's office. I'll give you another story on this. I'm big with stories because I think it helps drive the point home. I had a client whose husband died uh, 45 years old from a heart attack. I took her to Social Security. We got there on time at 10 a.m. 10.30, the woman comes out and says, you're late. Yeah, we're late. We've been there since 10. It's 10.30. Your appointment was at 10, right? It's 10.30, and we're looking at her like, okay, you have 10 minutes. This is what she says to us. She just lost her husband. She has two sons at home. So I said, okay. So we go in to the office. The woman is very curt, very short. Okay, well, we're going to have to do this online. Can't help you. And I'm listening around me, right, to the other people and how they're talking to them. And this is where you guys want to relate this to when you're talking to gatekeepers. They were talking to these Social Security people like they were dogs. Where's my money? Da da da. So she happened to reach for something, right? And she, anyone know what a Pandora bracelet is? She had a Pandora bracelet on with more charms than I'd ever seen. And I said, you know, I don't mean to change the subject. I know we have limited time, but how did you get so many charms on that bracelet? You would have thought a different person popped in her chair. Oh, I got it from my uncle and my son and my father. And this one came from here. An hour and a half later, after she pushed three meetings out that were in the lobby, she had set up all the applications for her boys and for her, got her all situated, gave us her personal phone number and said, I hate financial people, but I like you. <laughs> said, thank you. She didn't know anything about me. I didn't tell her one thing about me. Why did she like me? Because she got to talk about herself. And that's how human beings work. It's not a bad thing. And I was sincerely interested. I wasn't manipulating. I wanted to know because I was with my dad, and he bought a Pandora bracelet. That thing's expensive. He bought two charms, and it was 200 bucks. She had 19 charms on the thing. I wanted to know who got that for her. And I was generally interested. If you're generally interested when you talk to people, if you sit down with somebody who's interviewing you, and you see that they have 19 things about fishing on the wall, and you know anything about fishing, you might want to ask them, what do they like to fish? I don't know anything about fishing. I'm a New Yorker. I've never fished. So I wouldn't ask that question. I'd probably say, well, I admire what you do. I don't know anything about it. So, but people make decisions with emotion and support it with logic. It's not the other way around. A lot of people think, well, that doesn't sound right. We make decisions with logic. Not really. And I, think about it this way. If you were vacuuming your house and you had company coming over and your vacuum broke, and at the same time somebody rang the doorbell and said, we're giving away vacuums today for a month. You can try it and then get back to us. But the person offering you that vacuum was your childhood bully that you despised. Would you want the vacuum from them? Most likely not, right? But you, logically, you need a vacuum. So I say that because if you can make a human connection, like I did with that woman in the Social Security Department, we made a human connection. Then she supported with logic the fact that all her sons 
of my client needed to get situated. She also opened up and said, the reason why I was hostile is I thought you were here to tell me how to do my job. And I said, I don't know how to do your job, and from the sounds of it, I wouldn't want your job. She thanked me for that. But so it's always establishing that connection when you talk to people. Focus and mindset. How do you talk to yourself? Not like uh, the people on the street that randomly talk to themselves. We all talk to ourselves during the day. So do you say, I've been laid off, no one will hire me, I'll never forgive my ex-employer? Or do you ignore the negative voice in your head? When I do these workshops, I speak publicly 30, to 30 times a year. I teach on financial matters. I do these workshops. And there's always somebody who's not going to like it. It's just human nature. You're probably sitting there now nodding, saying, I'm that person. It's OK. I'm used to it. So what happens, though, is in your mind, we tend to gravitate as human beings towards the negative. I can do a workshop this big. People can give me evaluation forms. 99 of them will be great. One will be bad. And I'll say, why did that one person not like me? That's what we focus on. We can have 19 people wish us good morning. We say good morning to somebody. They don't say something back. What do we think on the way back to our desk? What's the matter with that person? What did I do to them? We focus on it. So it's important that we clear those things out when we talk to people, OK? Because the negative thoughts are going to come regardless. It's just how we deal with them when they come in. So be positive. I've taught, how many people worked at a job where they didn't know when their day was going to come when they were going to get let go? Happens a lot, right? You work in places where you never know if today's the day. Well, you don't have that problem anymore, do you? <laughs> There's a benefit. See, we always got to find a positive on things. I give you, I, when I was doing a workshop at Rochester Works not too long ago, I got a bad back from like tension. I got muscle knots. I was rushing. I got out of the shower. I dried my hair wrong and locked my back up, right? which is hard to do, by the way. So I couldn't move to the left. I get to do the workshop. I bend over to get my folders. I cut myself on the folder and bleed all over my presentations, right? So now I have to present bleeding on my presentations, and I can't move to the left. Well, everyone thought it was funny, and they all listened to what I had to say. So you can make a, some sort of connection with the things that you do. Focus and mindset. Take responsibility. Don't blame others. It'll just anger you even if it was somebody who justifiably wronged you. It won't matter when you're doing something. Would you hire an angry person? Think about it. You sat down to interview someone. You said, good morning. They said, what's so good about it? Why are you smiling? It's not going to work. You have to be positive, even if you're not feeling that happy. Okay? And I'm a firm believer of the law of attraction. You're going to get what you put out. Think about it. You ever have a bad day and were real angry and encountered 19,000 angry people that day? That's because you had a magnet out for them. That's just how that works. Or like if you stub your toe and then you hit your head and then you hit your shoulder, it's just those things. We welcome those things in. We can do it on the other end. The problem is it's harder to do it on the positive end because we gravitate towards the negative. So we have to just reinforce it and gravitate towards the positive. And what are your short-term and long-term goals? If you throw a ship in a harbor with no course, where's it going to go? Anywhere it wants. So we have to get some goals in mind to figure out which way we're going. <clears throat> and I would do that professional versus personal. How many people worked at a job they didn't really like and want a different career change? Happens all the time. I was teaching a class in Hilton, and a uh, Kodak guy, he was an engineer. You ever meet those technical people that seem so technical they don't even want to be touched by human beings? And so he was one of those people. He was sitting there. He was kind of, you know, I shook his hand when I met him, and he shook it with two fingers, you know, like, don't touch me. So um, I, he said, I changed my profession. I said, well, what would you change it to? In my mind, I'm like, okay, you probably went from engineer to rocket scientist, right? Something along those lines. I never heard anything like it. He changed his whole demeanor. He said, I'm a massage therapist. I could have fell over. <laughs> Guy was 61 years old. He was an engineer for 35 years, and now he's a massage therapist. But he was happy. His eyes lit up. He said, I'm doing something I really always wanted to do. Who knew? So when you go through these changes, it's important to define professionally and personally what you want to do. Because only you can achieve it. And it might, this might be, seen for the short term, a very difficult thing. But in the long term, it might be a very great thing. Um, if you could do anything right now, what would it be? That's a question I always ask my clients when it comes to their financial goals, but in general. If you could be doing anything now professionally, what would it be? What would you be doing? And clearly define it and think about it every day. When you get up in the morning, because a lot of the time, if we're in a troubled spot in our lives, when we get up in the morning, what's the first thing we're thinking about? The problems, right? Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Think about your goals. It'll get you on a different mindset as you go through and do things. You know, I only know this because of experience. You know, I uh, started out 
in the financial services industry at 23 years old, not from this area. And um, even though people kind of laugh at my New York accent, it was very hard to gain the trust of people when I first started in this business. It was. People heard my accent and they were like, hey, you know, he's going to rob my wallet. <laughs> so I had to overcome that stuff and I didn't know how to do it. And I was getting rejected all the time and beaten up, uh, not physically, but just emotionally. And so I got some books on sales and I went from being last to being first in the Northeast region for my first company as a rookie. I was, uh, got awards. I've, I've led the firm I work for now for three years in new client growth. And that's not because I'm the best by happenstance. It's because I study it like any craft. Any technical person, if you read one book on sales, when somebody says something to you, something will stick and say, I know how to handle that objection. Because a lot of objections are not real objections. They're what's called smokescreen objections. Has anyone ever heard of that term? That's when I don't want to change what I'm doing because as a human being, I don't like change. So when they ask you something, they'll give you some weird answer and move on because they don't want to change. They don't want to stop what they're doing. So you have to break their preoccupation. How many people have a written job acquisition plan for their day-to-day -day activities? Okay, good. We're in, the right, we're in the right place. Job acquisition plan is one of those things where this is a contact sport. Has anyone ever heard that term before? This is a contact sport. You only get the interview, you only get the referral, you only get the job by making what? Contacts, right? It's the only way we can do it. It's a contact sport. So the way to make contacts is we've got to make outbound attempts to do that. So um, we can actually work backwards and say, okay, how many appointments do I need to actually get an interview to actually get a job? So if you know you have to contact 20 people to get three referrals to get two appointments, well, then you can kind of define what your goals would be for the day as far as reaching out to people and put it on an Excel sheet. It doesn't have to be technical. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just number of attempts, number of contacts, number of appointments, number of referrals received. You cannot control the outcome. You can only control the process. So if you say, I want five referrals a day, you might not get it. But if you're swinging, if you're swinging, you'll hit one. If you're not swinging, you won't hit one. Okay? So... That way, if you look and say, okay, this is my goal for the day. I have this many resumes I want to send. I have this many people. Even if it's two. How many people have a goal to talk to somebody on a regular basis every day? Okay. Well, we're good. We're moving ahead here. We're really starting at a good point. So once we want to do is get it. So you talk to, if you're not talking to anybody on a daily basis, make your goal one person. That's easy. Because that means you're actually doubling the amount of people you talk to in one day. Yeah. All right. That's good. You increase your chances. Go from one to two. So what that does is, if you have a goal of talking to two a day, two people a day, could anything bad come of it? No, right? So those are the things. It's baby steps. I'm not saying, doing, you know, when you're a financial advisor, you're required to make 40 to 100 outbound calls a day. I'm not telling you to do that. That's why only 1% of the population does this job. There's only about 1% of crazy. But for all of you, one contact a day, one old coworker. Just to say, hey, what's going on? How's your job search going? Or how's work? And make sure that you're positive. Make sure you smile when you talk to these people. If you're really not feeling it because we're human beings and there's days where we're not going to feel it, guess what? Take the afternoon off. I know it's said, well, i got to find a job. Listen, calling somebody when you're agonizing or angry is not going to get you anywhere. You might make an enemy, but you definitely won't make a friend. And that's what we need to do is make friends. Speaking of making friends, how do you go about making con connections? How many people have an old Rolodex? How many people have went through it and listed out everybody that they knew? Have you called every one of those people? It's, it's the, the method of getting these people are going to be a lot easier to get a coffee commitment with them, to talk to them, and then once you're with them, it's what do you do with it. Okay, so when I go into any networking event, I have a goal in mind. So if I'm going to meet with an old coworker, I'm going to think about and maybe do what's called a network map. So in a few slides, I have a network map to show you. But what a network map does is, and LinkedIn is great for this, okay? Because a lot of the time, the information that you can get from LinkedIn can help you greatly. You see an old coworker who's on LinkedIn and they're connected with 50 people. Look at who they're connected with. See if it's anybody you want to know. 
And instead of asking for an introduction through LinkedIn, which is the easy way to do it, because you can say, hey, can you connect me? Bring that name with you to the meeting and say, hey, I, w I saw that you know Joe Smith. Do you think that would be a good person for me to talk to? How many people like to have their opinion asked? Right? Just call my mom. She'll tell you. She'll give you her opinion. She's a little Italian lady from Brooklyn. Any opinion you need, just call my mom. So what happens is if you get these old cell phones with phone books, previous companies' directories, people you did business with, competitors of your old company, salespeople you dealt with, salespeople get it. How many people had to deal with salespeople in some capacity? Office supply people. Those people know what's going on at the other places. It's their job to know what's going on at the other places. If you call those salespeople and say, hey, you know, I got let go. You were always really nice to me. I was wondering if we can grab a cup of coffee. They will say emphatically, yes. And then you could say, what's going on at this company? Oh, they're crazy. Don't go there. <laughs> the manager came out throwing coffee cups at my head. You know, these are the things the salespeople will tell you that. Because salespeople get to see the bad end of a lot of people. You know, so they can see how people act under duress, how people act under pressure. They're having a bad day. They're a great resource, and they get it. They know what you're trying to do. They know how hard it is to go out and forge contacts, and they'll help you. I guarantee it. If you have any salespeople you know, call them and ask them. They'll help you out. And uh, competitors of your old company are great, too. If you had a real rival, call them. And another thing, this is kind of a quirky suggestion, but anyone work in an office where they had one person nobody liked? If you say no, you might have been that person. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> if you had that one person, call them. Because how many people do you think take them to lunch? <laughs> Nobody, right? If you can take your medicine for an hour and take that person to lunch, what do those people do all day? They watch people. And they listen. Sometimes those people are invisible because people just tune them out. And they hear everything. If you can take them to lunch and actually listen to them, talk to them, What's going on in the office? You'll gather a lot of information, and it might be able to help you as you're looking at, at developing a roster of contacts. Because if you have a list of people that you know and people that you've worked with, and your goal is to contact five of them a day, now you have a written acquisition plan. It might be rough. It might just be starting, but now you have something. And having something is better than having nothing. So, and look to meet with people with mutually beneficial interests, recruiters, headhunters, Employees that get referral bonuses for getting you hired. That's a huge piece. And how you frame the question is also very important. Remember I was saying everybody's favorite station is WIIFM, right? So if you called somebody who worked at Paychex and said, hey, can you give my resume to your manager? What will they say? Yes, no, maybe. Doesn't really do anything for you, does it? Does that question really excite anybody in this room after listening to me for a half hour? Now, what if I said, hey, how'd you like to make 1500 bucks this morning? It's a bit more of an exciting question, right? But you know what that is, that 1500 bucks? That's the referral fee that Paychex pays their employees for referring in an employee. What do you want? A job, right? So it's the same thing you want them to do. Give your resume into the supervisor, right? It's just how you frame the question. So it's beginning with the end in mind when you talk to people. And that's creating a win-win situation. The name of somebody hiring. If that's what you want, think about what you might be able to bring to the table for that person. If you've been out perusing your industry, you might have some market intelligence that could help somebody that's still in another company. You could say, this is what I've seen going on at this company. Hey, do you know anybody at XYZ? So it's kind of like an exchange, a barter system of information. But these are the things, while you're out, while you're not working, it gives you time to gather intelligence. That's why I love LinkedIn. I think that you can, I don't even get to use it as often as I'd like to because it's hard to access it during the day for me because I'm always in some appointment or something. But it's a great tool. Get it on your smartphone if you have a smartphone. Because you meet with somebody, you can find them and look at who their connections are. And you can really kind of work backwards to get to somebody who's a decision maker that's a hiring person. It's all about finding the right people to talk to. You know, I've had HR, I have HR people as clients. And I hate to tell you that sometimes they tell me, Mike, we got 500 resumes for this job. I said, and who'd you pick? Uh, my boss's nephew. Did he submit a resume? No. What? Yeah, my boss came in and said, look, for this position, let's, let's go with, you know, Henry, young Henry. So, or old Henry, who knows? But it, the thing is, it, it could be just somebody that they know. 
And that's what happens. So you want to be that person that they know as opposed to a cold walk-in. And always think in terms of what you can do for them. I keep saying it over and over again because it's very important. So this is kind of what a network referral map looks like. So if you want to get to a hiring manager, well, there's a number of ways to get there. If you've identified who you want to talk to, okay, then you can work up and say, okay, maybe through LinkedIn there's somebody there. Or maybe a civic organization like Kiwanis, like uh, the Chamber of Commerce, like the RBA, the Rochester Business Alliance. So there's all these different organizations that you could join. Trade organizations, if you're an engineer, if you're an accountant, they have national organizations that have local chapter levels that you can go meet with. Why that's important is if you're at one of these events, what do you think is going to be there? People in your industry that are working. So the trick is you go to places like this, go to places like New Horizons, which is great, run by Pete Chatfield and those places, but at the same time, go to places where you're the minority, where you're not working and everybody else is, because that's how you're going to find some things. Think out of the box when you go to some of these networking events. This is like a training ground. You take that info, and then you go out to other places that not everybody else is going. I would actually challenge you that if you go to a place to network and you're looking to really gain a contact and you see 25 other people that are at another networking group, leave. Because it's everyone feeding at the same thing. So you want to try to create unique situations. BNI, Business Networking International, that is a group where you have to pay to join. Okay? I don't belong to it. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just letting you know that that's a group where they don't have like-for-like -like industries. So it, Nine financial advisors can't join it. Nine realtors can't join it. It has to be one of each industry. But you can go as somebody's guest. So if you join the chamber or, or you know somebody from Kiwanis that's on BNI, you can go to a meeting just to check it out and you get those people's business cards. You know, heck, you could start your own BNI type meeting where everyone's required to bring a referral each week. These are, there's countless possibilities. But here's the cool part doing all this effort, you know what you need? One yes. Just one yes. And I used to have a manager that checked how many no's we got in the day. He didn't care how many yeses. How many people told you no today? I said, what is he, crazy? He said, no, because if you're not being told no, you're not asking anybody anything. And company affiliations. There's a lot of different ways to meet people, and everybody knows somebody. So referrals. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Decide who you want to meet and create a referral map to get there. Okay? Who, do you, who do you know? Who do they know? How are they connected? And be specific in who you want to meet. A lot of the time, if you meet with somebody and say, hey, you know, I'd like to find a hiring manager. Okay? What industry, what company, what do you want to do? But if you say, hey, I'm in aeronautics and I'm an engineer and I make this specific gadget and I want to work for Harris, now what we just do? We just really put a finite spotlight on that person. So being specific when you talk to people, uh, when I meet with clients, I usually tell them, do you have anybody who just recently lost their job because I specialize with people who lost their jobs? Well, that gives them something to look at to say, okay, do I know anybody who lost their job? Instead of, hey, who do you know that would like to meet me? Nobody would like to meet me. Well, depending. But an acquaintance of a friend was laid off and found work. Do you think that he or she knows what you're going through? Do you think they might have empathy and want to help? So when you hear these stories of people landing, how many people go to networking groups and hear somebody landed? Okay. When you hear the name of somebody landing, make note of it. Find out where they're working and send them a congratulations card. And call them and say, hey, I was wondering if I could pl pluck your brain, if I could pick your information. Find out how you did what you did. Go the extra mile. Look at the people on the move in the Rochester paper. They have people getting promoted and finding new jobs. Call those people. I'm telling you, you think people would say, oh, no, and hang up. No, they'll want to talk to you. Say, hey, I'm a job seeker. I noticed you landed. Congratulations. How'd you do it? And they'll tell you. They'll say, this is what I did. This is, I knew somebody. But what I'm saying is other ways to garner market intelligence, unique ways. Um, I also tell people all the time, find a local print shop, right? They make coffee mugs. Go get 20 coffee mugs made with your CV on the side of it or just your contact information and mail it to the hiring managers you want to meet and call them up two weeks later and say, hey, I'd like to fill that coffee mug. Think they'll take your phone call? So it's these little things that 
you know, unique offspins. If you have a place, a local firm you're, wor you're trying to get into, stop by the gatekeepers on a Friday morning with munchkins. I don't mean little people, I mean the donuts. <laughs> I just had to wake you all up. So you go in there with it and you bring it to them with your business card. Say, hey, I just wanted to stop by and say hi. Enjoy these donuts, have a great weekend, and leave. They're going to remember you. And when you call up a week later to get through the gatekeeper, do you think that they're going to be nicer or meaner to you? There's one thing I know in this business. People like sugar. It's just these things you learn. So how to ask for the referral. Typically what I would do is find somebody that you want to connect with and ask them the coffee or lunch or, you know, whatever, if you're at a networking meeting, and sit down with them and say, you know, Jim, I have a question for you. If their name isn't Jim, don't call them Jim. I just figured I'd throw that out there. If you have a question, it's perfectly okay if you say no or need to get back to me. But if you were me, and this is where it comes into play. If you were me, who would you call over at Xerox? Because now they have to put themselves mentally in your shoes. Okay, because sometimes if they're in their shoes, what are they thinking? Well, geez, I don't want to give this guy a name. What are they going to say to them? Are they going to offend them? Are they going to bite them? Are they going to, you know, stalk them? But if you put them in your shoes and say, if you were me, who would you call over at Xerox? I'd call, you know, this guy. I think he'd be good. But now you get a name. Okay, so it's important on how you do that. And then be quiet. Silence is deafening. It's worse pressure than anything. Just say, if you were me, who would you call? And then just be quiet and smile. <laughs> and just wait. Five seconds will seem like two minutes, I guarantee you. you know, I remember one of the largest deals I closed in my career. The guy was a trained salesman, and he knew what I was doing. So I uh, had the uh, paperwork out, and I slid the pen towards him. And I smiled and said, I look forward to the opportunity to work with you. And we sat there for five minutes staring at each other, smiling. <laughs> and then he said, the first guy who talks loses. You know that, right? <laughs> and he signed. And he said, I knew what you were doing. But so, and that's an extreme case. And I was sweating. And I was glad he stopped then because I was just about to break. But it won't last that long for you. Two minutes somewhat, right away. If you just be quiet and smile, they'll say, let me get back to you. And it's OK if they say, let me get back to you. Most people will say, let me get back to you, okay? And why that's nice is if they say, let me get back to you, you have a way to follow up with them. But be assumptive. Don't say, do you know anyone? Who doesn't know someone, right? When you think about it, who doesn't know someone? Who do you know? Not, do you know anyone? Everybody knows somebody. Who do you know? And create the verbal contract. They say they want to get back to you. Right? Which is, how many people have heard that? How many people have asked for a referral and they said, I got to get back to you? Let me look. How'd you get back to them? Here's a defined way. Jim says, I'll have to get back to you. You say, great. I sincerely appreciate you thinking about this. I know life gets busy. Here's the hook. And this probably isn't the first thing on your mind. Remember, what's in it for them, not for you. So if it's okay, if I don't hear back from you first, would it be okay if I got back to you in a few weeks? It's very low key. Say, so, yeah, no problem. This is where a good contact management system comes in. Okay? This is where you pop up your Outlook and you put in notes, follow up with Jim Smith for referrals in two weeks. Now, it doesn't mean you call them up in two weeks and say, where are my names? You don't do that. Two weeks goes by and you don't hear anything. You email them and you say, hey, you know what? I know life gets busy. I really don't mean to be a pain in the butt because that's that putting the ghost on the table thing. I don't mean to be a pain in the butt. I was just wondering if you had a chance to see if you knew anybody. They'll say, you know what? I will get back to you, and they will get back to you. Okay? So it's a process. It's a drip process. You want to keep them in front of you. I suggest to some people, if they're inclined to write, do a blog. Do a newsletter. Do something to keep you in front of people. Anyone who's a client of mine, and there's actually one or two in the room, know that I do things to keep me in front of you. You have newsletters, events, things that you remember me. And that because people are thinking about what all day? Thank you. Ah, this is working. Good. We're good today. People are thinking about themselves all day. You ha and it's not a bad thing. It's just how human beings are. So if you put yourself in front of them in some way, they'll remember you. And create a follow-up system. Outlook reminders are wonderful because you can then make notes. If you put your contacts in Outlook, Okay, if you don't feel inclined to do it yourself, if you have children, they're probably quicker than you are on the thing. I know I, I have interns. I, I'm starting to feel old. 
these interns come in, and I think I'm quick, man, and they're just, wow, you know? They come in, hey, I revamped your Excel sheet. What do you think? I'm looking at it. I'm like, how the hell did they even do that? You know? I mean, I've wanted to do that. I just can't do it. These people are so quick with it. So, I mean, get a niece, get a nephew, get somebody, say, hey, I'll pay you a buck a name or whatever. I mean, if money's tight, don't do that. But, you know, some incentive. I'll get pizza for you. Can you do these? Can you help me out? Get them all into Outlook with names, phone numbers, and email addresses. And then when you open up that contact, when you talk to them, you know, in the notes section, just write the date and what you talked about. Because if you're talking to people on a regular basis, how are you going to remember everybody you talk to and what they say? But if you put it in there and you call them back and say, hey, how's your dog? I know last time we spoke, dog was sick. Oh, dog's good. They're going to think you're the greatest person on earth. You remember these things. I'm giving away my trade secrets. So now my clients call me and be like, ah, oh, this guy's full of it. I really do care. But you can never keep track of 200 people if you're talking to them. Unless you have a memory like a, you know, Rain Man or something, you're not going to be able to, to remember all of this. So you write it down. Talk to people. If somebody has an accomplishment that you're networking with, celebrate it with them. Send them a congratulations card. If you have a networking appointment and you get a referral, send them a thank you note. Not an email, a thank you note, a physical thank you note. Because that's the lost art of what people do nowadays. Everyone sends an email. It's very easy, right? We've got to break the trend of easy in order to change things. Go to an office supply place like Staples and get 50 blank thank you cards for 10 bucks. That's a good deal. If you have a printer or you have access to one that's more specialized, you could put the settings of that card in that printer and you could like type out your own name so they look like you went to a print shop. So now you have personalized cards that cost you 12 bucks and the stamp to send them. So these are the type of things that can really help you as you get in front of people. And they're not expensive. See, my goal today isn't to say, let's go, you know, go do a huge seminar and get people to it. That, that's not practical. If you're in a job seeking mode and trying to save pennies, Staples is great. You know, when I was a rookie, my first paycheck for two weeks worth of work was $1.44. My wife said, are you sure you want to go into this business? I framed it. It's on my wall at home. I said, I'm not cashing this. I opened up one college education savings account and they paid me $1.44. I said, I must be nuts. And I framed it up on my wall and I still have it. I never cashed it. So I know about pinching pennies. I would go to Staples, get those thank you cards, send those out. They go a long way. People will remember you. You interview with somebody. You talk, here's another good one. You talk to a gatekeeper. You get their name. They don't let you through. Write them a thank you note. How many times do you think the gatekeeper, the person paid to keep people away, gets a thank you note? Zilch. If they even get one, they'll remember your name. So you have to establish relationships and then those relationships breed other relationships and breed other relationships. Interview and sales tips. I'm going to give you guys a little test and we'll see how we all do. Up. What do you all think? I'll say a word. You say a word that comes to your mind. Up. Yeah. Left. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. So that means most of you are quasi-normal in the room. That's good. The reason why I say that is because the mind seeks to balance. So when you call someone and you want to talk to them, what do we usually say? Are you busy right now? What does the mind do? Right? Think about it. It's a subtle thing. But if you call and say, hey, is now a bad time? No, now's a good time. It's weird stuff, but it works. Those little things, guys, when you talk to people. Try it the next time you leave here. You go to a supermarket or you see somebody you know, it's now a bad time. No, now's a good time. They could be on fire. It's now a bad time. No, now's a good time. The left arm's falling off. It's fine. <laughs> because the mind will say that before they're even thinking. Because we do that automatically. Anyone ever read anything from Malcolm Gladwell? He's great. His book, Blink, talks all about that stuff. We do things in a split second thing without thinking about it. So if you're walking into somewhere and you're smiling and you're talking to them, people will make that assumption on you right away. I bet a lot of you, when you walked in the room, looked at me and made an assumption about me right before I said anything. Even if you didn't do it consciously. We do that. You know? So it's important that we think about those things when we engage people. And the other thing, and, I, and I'm going to end with this, is that when people ask you a question in an interview, it's a hiring sign. But you don't know what type of hiring sign it is. So if they say, are oh, you a team person, what do we always want to say? 
Yes, I was born on a team. <laughs> right? But what if they just disbanded all their teams and they don't want anything to do with that? So when they ask you a question, you might want to come back and say, why is that important to this role? Very simple question. But it forces them to elaborate on why they're asking the question. Okay? Because if you don't know, you might spend 20 minutes convincing them why you're not the person to hire. Right? And we do that all the time. People will ask a question. They might not want to know that you like that. They might want to know the opposite. So this is some of the things that I've learned engaging people in all the different stuff that, you know, that I've done over the years talking to people. But so if somebody says something like that to you, ask them the question, why is that relevant? And be sincere. Look them in the eye. Smile a little bit. If you have to follow up with somebody, I'm going to give you one question that you can always ask, and they'll always say yes. Ready? Fair enough. I will follow up with you in two weeks, Jim. Fair enough? Sure. You could say, hey, look, um, in two weeks, I'm going to come through your front door with a shotgun, and I'm going to shoot you. Fair enough? Sure. See you then. <laughs> it's just people don't even think about it. They just say, yep, that sounds good. I know. It sounds odd. I'm a strange person. I know. But these things do work. So if you say fair enough when you're following up with someone, they'll agree. And then just put a note in your outlook to follow up with them, and you'll be able to get hold of them. With that, guys, this is what I do for people. I work with boomers in transition. If you know anybody that fits that criteria, I'd be happy to talk to you. I wish you all the best of luck today. I hope that you guys find a job. Happy networking. If you want to know me any better, talk to Annie. She knows who I am and where I work. Thank you very much for your time. Good luck.